Trevor Bauer's path back to the majors isn't getting any easier. The Clippers head to Denver, wondering if their big two is anywhere close to Denver's big two. And the Clippers do not commit to Kawhi Leonard playing in the first round of the NBA playoffs. Good morning, I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. And it is April 18th, 2024. Welcome to the Sanctum Sanctorum of LA Sports. We added a new subscriber to the Angelino Familia yesterday. Thank you for getting in on the ground floor. And if you like being in the know about LA, click the clack the like button. Click the clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that. It'll let you know when we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. Now, before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Look, the Dodgers are still in first place. And even if they weren't, I would not panic. But it is just not a good look to lose a series to the Nationals, which they did after getting shut out yesterday, 2-0. to zero. Wow. First shutout this time for the Dodgers this year. Shohei Otani at least did his part, collected three hits. Meanwhile, tonight, Chicago's in town to face the Kings at 7.30. Now, the Kings are in the playoffs, but they don't know who their opponent is, and they don't even know who the seeding is. It comes down to this. If Las Vegas beats Anaheim tonight, all bets are off. The Kings slide down to a wild card spot, and they play Dallas. If the Ducks upset the Golden Knights tonight, and the Kings win... LA finishes in third, and they will face Edmonton for a third consecutive year. Now let's get to the news. Yesterday we were discussing how an accuser against former Dodgers pitcher and Cy Young Award winner Trevor Bauer has been charged with theft and fraud. The girl, she was charged, and she was trying to steal and or extort from him, allegedly, allegedly. Now, if you want the details, look up yesterday's clip because the details about all the accusations about Bauer are gross. True or false? Debatable. Gross? Absolutely. Don't need to repeat them. But if you're keeping score, it goes like this. There are four accusers against Trevor Bauer. One, the accuser from San Diego, had a bevy of clips and texts that definitely insinuated that she was having sex with him in order to try to steal the bag. In other words, extort money from him later. Two, a second person is in Arizona is now facing felony charges about fraud and theft. So yesterday, I was wondering aloud, what about the other two accusers? Bauer went to Twitter yesterday and said, hey, uh, those other two accusers, they didn't file a criminal case. They did not file a civil case. In other words, they didn't try to sue. They didn't even join the other two civil cases that were against him. Therefore, and by the way, I haven't been able to independently verify those claims about the other two women. Therefore, he is arguing clean sweep. The matter should be closed. Can I pitch in the majors again now? To that question, I would answer no, not yet. But, for not, but not for the reasons that you think. An example, he's currently pitching for Diablos Rojos del Mexico, but he got knocked around in his first outing. He allowed four earned runs in three and two thirds innings. His ERA is 9.82. And as a result, there are some obviously bitter scribes who went on to say that he's pitching like ass. Now that is extremely premature. Not to mention your bias against Trevor Bauer is showing despite the fact that two of these women, oh boy, it's just one game. And he actually pitched very well in Japan. But even if you are a Bauer apologist, and for the record, I was just like, hey, let's just wait till the evidence come out before we start pointing fingers. But even if you are a Bauer apologist, you have to acknowledge that his path is not straight or smooth. For instance, for people to look the other way on such tawdry accusations, you have to be a beloved athlete. Trevor Bauer is not Kobe Bryant. Trevor Bauer is not Tiger Woods. He is not beloved. 
In terms of popularity, Trevor Bauer is probably akin to Brett Favre sending penis pics to a female reporter. And I'm not talking Brett Favre in Green Bay. I'm talking Brett Favre with the New York Jets, right? Not beloved. Then you have to recall the Dodgers paid his salary when he was on suspension. The Dodgers aren't going to take that risk again. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, etc. I would assume that Bauer's three other former teams probably feel the same way. That would be Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Arizona. Also, in the past, while this whole thing was unfurling, four teams said they wanted no part of them. The Yankees, the Mets, the Cubs, the Padres. That supposedly kills off eight teams. More than a quarter of Major League Baseball doesn't want to have anything to do with Trevor Bauer. At least. And then there's another problem. Bauer loves to play the villain. Right? If you taunt him, he will egg you on. Suppose a sexual assault victim or just a random woman boos him. And he does something like, in order to ask for more taunting. Even if he doesn't know who taunted him, it's going to look like he's poking fun at sexual assault victims. And that is a PR nightmare, whether he is guilty or innocent. Does Bauer have it in him to not play the villain? To turn the other cheek? I don't see it. I don't. So the way I see it, Bauer has two options. And the obvious one is to pitch much, much better than he did in his opener in Mexico. That could happen as soon as his next start. And keep pitching that way until one of the other 22 Major League teams blinks. The other is to just straight up sue Major League Baseball and Commissioner Rob Manfred. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I could see a case being made. I was wrongfully removed from a job I was good at, from a job I loved, and it was all based on a lie. That's a that I'm sure you can make a legal argument from that. And that's the memo. Yesterday, we also discussed how the bottom of the Dodgers lineup is worse than a backup quarterback in the UFL. Uh, currently, slots seven through nine is a witch's brew of Kike Hernandez, Gavin Lux, Chris Outman and Chris Taylor, uh, James Outman and Chris Taylor. The MLB average from those three spots on a team is 230. The Dodgers batting average on those three spots is 162. Slugging percentage is even more pronounced. It's 100 points worse than the major league average. Now for his part, Dave Roberts said it's way too early to make snap judgments. I will give him the benefit of the doubt on that. But if you're saying, why are the Dodgers kind of mediocre right now? It's the bullpen and it's spots seven through nine. Welcome to Ridiculously Obvious Thursday. The Lakers were more than willing yesterday to fill the scribes ears with tidbits that you would expect prior to facing the Denver Nuggets in the first round of the playoffs. It was all patently obvious. Oh, we want all the smoke. What did you expect them to say? right? Oh my God, we're screwed. Did you expect them to say that? Right? Second obvious thing, Anthony Davis says he's going to be 100% for Saturday's game one. Third obvious thing, LeBron James was willing to skip a game or two toward the end of the year so that his injured foot could heal. Now the brakes are off. He will be playing every game. We all knew this. Now, as for the scribes, what they have been writing on their own is just as damn obvious. That Nikola Jocic and Jamal Murray were the two best players in the series last year. Yes, we knew that. So if we were over to oversimplify, how do the Lakers compete? The task is, how do Anthony Davis and or LeBron James crash that party? In other words, the Joker is going to be the best player in the series. I think we could concede that. But if James and Davis are two and three, now you're talking. Now it's going to be a pain in the rear for Denver to knock out the Lakers. The problem the Lakers have with Murray, though, is who guards him. We mentioned it yesterday. Gabe Vincent was signed to give some help, but the guy hasn't been healthy all year. 
Moreover, the reason that they signed Vincent was because Vincent was going to be the contingency plan when the Lakers facilitated a D'Angelo Russell trade. Well, Vincent was never healthy, therefore no D'Angelo Russell trade was ever facilitated. Now, Russell can score, but he's not going to be able to D up on Jamal Murray. Neither can Austin Reeves, for that matter. James could for a while, for a while. And I have another thought. If you remember last year's playoffs, there were games where you wondered if Anthony Davis straight up just took the day off. It didn't cost him when they played Memphis. It didn't cost him when they played Golden State, but it damn sure did against the Nuggets. So simply put, I don't know how the hell they're going to stop Murray, but for the Lakers to have a shot for Anthony Davis and LeBron James to be the second and third best players in this series and thus give them a legit shot at the upset. We know Davis has to be dominant in every single game. No days off. Tyron Lue said the Clippers are preparing as if Kawhi Leonard will be available for game one against Dallas. And that was originally supposed to be on Saturday. It was pushed back a day. Leonard has missed eight consecutive games. They were all in the regular season with knee inflammation. He has been practicing this week. Lue would not, however, commit to Leonard playing in the first round. UCLA football coach Deshaun Foster has claimed the quarterback competition is wide open. That is what he has been saying to the press. And then the LA Times exposed the reality. Ethan Garbers has taken every snap with the first team in spring practice. So you can say it's a competition. I didn't buy it then, and I damn sure don't buy it now, coach. Not saying you're a terrible coach. Not saying I don't want UCLA to finally experience a modicum of success after the Chip Kelly era. But you tried to pull a fast one on me. You tried to pull a fast one on us all. We all knew it was Ethan Garbers. Just be honest about it. The Chargers have signed so many Baltimore Ravens players. Not only the players, they've signed Baltimore Ravens coaches, they've signed Baltimore Ravens front office types, that you almost have to wonder if a name change is appropriate, right? They're not really Chargers, they're Baltimore. Um, but there are no Ravens in California, to my knowledge. Uh, there is the Titmouse, there's a bird. I'd hate to see what that logo looks like on a helmet. Uh, but the Bolts... The reason I bring it up is the Bolts signed yet another former Ravens player yesterday in running back J.K. Dobbins. He's the second ex-Ravens running back to move west. He's been in the league for four years. And of course, you've heard me say this a bunch of times. He was signed. He's going to be familiar with the offense that's going to be run by former Ravens coordinator Greg Roman. I suppose Robbins is going to, uh, Dobbins is going to slot as a backup He's only uh, rushed for about 1,300 yards in his career. And oh, by the way, blew out his Achilles last year. So at least the running back uh, room got a little deeper. I mentioned the day after the WNBA draft that it was a bona fide pain in the rear to find an even-handed review. Because ESPN spent the entire time being life-affirming about every pick. And most news outlets, frankly, they, they may act like they care about the WNBA, but trust me, they don't give a damn about the WNBA. So when it comes to their draft, they're just going to hand out a bunch of A's, like participation trophies, right? And then they go back to eating their bag of little chocolate donuts. But unlike them, we actually are going to care about the LA Sparks because they are Angelinos. Angelinos do not look for affirmation. We play to win. That's the point of sports. It's a meritocracy. You play to win. So I finally found what I thought was a thorough review of the entire WNBA draft, team by team, player by player. The Athletic gave the Sparks an A. And I trust this review, not because they gave the Sparks an A, but because they gave out lower grades to other teams. Not everybody gets an A. Some barely passed. You have to do just more than show up to deserve an A. 
So the Athletic called it a, quote, home run draft, unquote, for L.A. We've talked about the two picks, Cameron Brink, Rakea Jackson, and how they're going to fit in a revamped Sparks front court. But they also labeled the third round pick, USC's Mackenzie Forbes, as, quote, just good business, unquote. Why? She's described as responsible with the ball, someone who makes shots, and she is from USC, which means there's probably going to be a few Trojans fans who would be marginally interested in going to see a WNBA game. But you let me know what you think in the comments thread. Talk to me about Trevor ba uh, Bauer's path back to the majors. Do the Lakers have a big two that might be more likely to compete with Denver's big two? And if you enjoy the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We are talking LA sports here every single day. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.